what is so unique about Jesus Christ? Because my Muslim friend would say, well, Muhammad is equal to Jesus. And uh, why are you convinced in the case for Christ? I'm convinced, uh, first of all, because Jesus made a startling claim. He claimed that he's the Son of God. That's clear from history. He made that assertion. Now, anybody can claim that. And when I was a reporter, we did a lot of investigative stories about mental hospitals. And I want to tell you, there's no shortage of people who will tell you they're God. And they're clearly not. But why is it that people around the planet have believed Jesus? The question is, do you have any evidence to back up your claim? And what we have is the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He didn't just say I'm the Son of God, but we have convincing evidence. We have uh, evidence, you know, I taught the five E's real quick to summarize the evidence for the resurrection. The execution of Jesus. He was clearly dead when he was taken off the cross. I mean, even the Journal of the American Medical Association did an article analyzing the historical medical data and said clearly he was dead even before the spear was thrust into his side. Secondly, we have the empty tomb. Everybody in the ancient world agreed the tomb of Jesus was empty on that first Easter morning. The question was, how did it get empty? And of course, the religious authorities made up the story that the disciples had somehow stolen the body. Well, they didn't have the means or the motive or the opportunity. So that clearly isn't the answer. But the, the tomb was clearly empty. Third, we have eyewitnesses. Over 515 eyewitnesses, including skeptics whose lives were transformed because they encountered the resurrected Jesus in a lot of different circumstances. They touched him, they ate with him, they communicated with him. This is not a legend, not a hallucination, not wishful thinking. This was reality. And then we have early records. And this is so important, I think, when we look at the difference between Islam and Christianity. And I have a dear Muslim friend who comes over to my house and we grill steaks and we talk about this. And, you know, the point I tried to make to him was I said, you know, this is not, you know, Jesus claimed to be the Son of God. We have all these things so far, you know, the execution, the empty tomb, and the eyewitnesses so far. But we also have early records of all of this. And why that's important is, I used to think this idea that Jesus is the Son of God who rose from the dead was a legend that grew up in the many centuries later. But what we have preserved for us is a creed of the early church that summarizes the essence of Christianity. The Apostle Paul reports it in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 and following. This creed says Jesus died. Why? For our sins. He was buried. He was resurrected on the third day. And then it mentions the names of specific eyewitnesses, including skeptics, who encountered him and were willing to die for their conviction that he returned from the dead and proved he's the Son of God. Now, this creed has been dated back by scholars from a wide range of theological belief to as early as 24 to 36 months after the life of Jesus, and the beliefs that make up that creed go right back to the cross itself. So this is like a newsflash from ancient history. This is reliable historical data. Now, I said to my Muslim friend, I said, now, you know, I have this data, and not just those E's, I'll give you one more real quick, the emergence of the church. How do you explain the sudden explosion of the Christian church onto the scene in the very same city where Jesus was put to this humiliating, degrading death just a few weeks later? How do you explain that apart from the resurrection? Because we have records of, of, of Peter getting up to this group and saying, men of Israel, listen to these words. This Jesus, you remember him, he did miracles in your midst. You know that he did. And then he said, God raised him from the dead, to which we're all witnesses. And what did they say? Did they say, Peter, you're out of your mind. You don't know what you're talking about. No. 3,000 of them said, Peter, we know you're telling the truth. We know these things are true. What do we do? And they found repentance and, and, and faith in Jesus Christ. The church was born. 3,000 people that day. How do you explain that if the resurrection isn't true? So I said to my Muslim friend, I said, I've got all this historical data, fresh, right back to the scene. And then I had Muhammad who over 600 years later says he is told by an angel in a cave that Jesus did not die on the cross. There was no resurrection. Look at the, you know, I've read the Quran, Surah 4, verse 157. It says Jesus didn't die on the cross. And also the Quran is very clear. It says God did not have a son. So I say, okay, just, just from an historical analysis perspective, if I have this really reliable historical data for the resurrection, and then I've got someone 600 years later saying it's not true, where does the evidence most logically point in terms of something that I can put my trust in? So we've had a lot of debates about this kind of thing, and I think it's healthy to engage in these kind of dialogues with people because, you know, I think as Christians, we have an unfair advantage in the marketplace of spiritual ideas. And that unfair advantage, if I can be frank, is the truth is on our side. And so we ought to be able to say, you know what, 
Peter tells us in 1 Peter 3.15, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. We should be prepared, we should be ready to be able to help people understand, not just what we believe as Christians, but why we believe it.